we stand across the house tonight as we get ready to go before the Lord in prayer for this service. Let's lift our hearts, lift our voices together in one accord before the Lord tonight. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to come and to be in your house, to come and feel your touch and your help. God, to come and feel your spirit sweeping over this place. Lord, we come with faith and not trust and believe in God that you're going to move, that you're going to work, Lord. That it's going to be more than just an ordinary, just another service, just another Wednesday night. God, we didn't come, Lord, just to put a check in the box and say we fulfilled our obligation, but we come tonight to, with hunger and desire and expectation to see your spirit move and touch, uh, to see you heal and deliver and set free to see you work the miraculous and the supernatural in our midst. God, I pray that faith uh, would be elevated in this house tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that your word would go forth in this place tonight in a mighty way. Uh, I pray, Lord, tonight that you would loose uh, the gifts of the Spirit to be in operation across this house. Uh, God, that there would be a divine intervention, uh, a divine interruption of the Holy Ghost uh, that would fall upon us in this place tonight. Uh, God, we give you thanks uh, and we give you praise uh, for the visitation of your Spirit uh, and glory that's in this house. Uh, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Worship tonight.
Praise the Lord. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for your love. And we give you praise and we give you glory, almighty God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is awesome. And I want to welcome each and every one of you and our visitors here today. And I thank God for each and every one of you. We serve an awesome and mighty God. And if you notice, we're fixing to do some baptizing back here in the back. The water's warm, the water's there, there's ministers back there, and if anybody wants to get baptized today, you can get baptized. So right now, let's go and watch them as they baptize this one. Amen. So glad that Michael Blake has seen his need to be baptized. He told us he was ready for Jesus to wash his sins away, that he needed to be baptized. If you would join me in prayer right quick, we're going to pray over it. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much, Jesus, for this opportunity, Lord. God, thank you for revealing, Lord, the need to be baptized in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray that you would continue your work, God. I pray that you would anoint him and use him greatly, Lord. God, in Jesus' name we pray, Lord. We dedicated him to you, Lord, and we dedicated his life to you, Lord. God, and we know this is one step on the journey, Lord. Thank you so much, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Michael Blake Melton, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Praise the Lord. It's still open. And it'll be open for as long as you want it to be open. And you're more than welcome to come in at that water. I mean, that water feels great. So <laughs> let's go about and let's shake each other's hand and welcome each other to the house of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
thankful where the Lord has brought you from would you give him praise in this house tonight thank you God for your goodness and mercy for your loving kindness to us tonight hallelujah you can be seated God bless you great to see you in the house of the Lord tonight you have guests with us and uh, I think several of them didn't come necessarily just for preaching they had grandkids getting baptized. I'd have been here too. Amen. I went back there, and of course, you got aunts and uncles and cousins and all kind of stuff back there. And I told them, I said, next time we may have to move the baptism to the fellowship hall. They were packed in there like a can of sardines in the back hall and then the, behind the baptistry and up the stairs and so on. Uh, we're so thankful for our kids. Have you noticed it has become a trend in the last few days? that uh, we have not skipped very many services whatsoever with folks being baptized. Matter of fact, we got another one coming Sunday morning. Gonna get baptized on Sunday morning. Thankful for what God is doing. Hallelujah. We're in a revival uptick. Of new ones receiving the Holy Ghost. So proud of chastity receiving the Holy Ghost on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you, that family has set their world on fire. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the young preacher that was here was on the back row of the Pearl. Uh, I think he pastors a church in the area. And it was too far for him to have them. He's been working on Jake and his wife. He works with them, been working on them for a long time. And I thought the old boy was going to have a total meltdown that he was able to be here when she got the Holy Ghost. And I thought that was fantastic. He said, you need to go to Brother Lambert's. That's where you first started church at, and that's where you're getting baptized at, that's where you need to carry your family to. And so he came with them to service, and we were so glad to see them. We had a great number of guests on Sunday morning. We had a great number of guests Sunday night. We got a good number of guests here tonight. We're glad to have Brother David with us tonight. Glad he came uh, visiting with us. And we just welcome all of you. Just uh, take your liberty in the house of the Lord. I was thinking as I was uh, contemplating uh, things that was going on in service tonight. Uh, there was a man that came to the Lord and he asked the Lord to pray. He said, pray for my daughter. And uh, he said, uh, where is she at? Where do I need to go to? And he said, Lord, you don't even have to come to my house. You can speak the word right now and it'll be taken care of there. You know what? We've got a God that's at work more than just in Iuka, Mississippi. We got a God that's at work more than just Iuka First United Pentecostal Church. It's irrelevant where the need is. It's irrelevant what the situation is. When we began to speak to the Lord, the Lord can speak a word where they are and God can bring about a great miracle in their behalf. I want you to know tonight he's not limited to this service. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. He's not limited to time or space. Uh, may I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's everywhere all the time. If you've got family in Timbuktu, he's in Timbuktu right now. If you've got lost loved ones somewhere around the world, uh, he's where they are right now. I just wonder right now if our faith was enough uh, that we would speak to the good Lord uh, and he would touch them where they are. Uh, he had ministered to the needs in their life. Uh, he had opened the door. Uh, he had break the chains and usher them out. Uh, praise the name of the Lord. And ask the rest if you would join them as they remain standing right now. We do have a special need that we need to pray for tonight. A wonderful lady most of you know. Uh, her name is Cynthia Lambert. 
Uh, she cuts my hair and has for a long time. Uh, but Cynthia's daughter, Rebecca, is expecting a baby. And they found out today that the baby's head is right up under her rib cage. And they said they need a miracle in behalf of that baby. It needs to turn before it's born. And so she asked that we would pray for that baby tonight. And that's exactly what we're going to do. That baby's not here in this building. That baby's elsewhere. But as I told you, God is where that baby's at right now. And God can touch that baby. I wonder, would you lift your hands and would you lift your faith right now? And would you call on the name of the Lord in behalf of that baby? Wonderful Savior. I thank you, God, tonight for the privilege of approaching to a throne that has all power. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're God and you change not. I thank you, God, that you hear. You only hear God, but you answer. I thank you, God, tonight that you're where that need is at. I plead the blood of Jesus in behalf of that baby. I ask you, God, that it would be born. It would be born healthy. It would be born normal. That the situation would be rectified. I pray in behalf of the mother and the baby and the family tonight. Oh, God, there are other needs listed across this house tonight. Some have been spoken. Some are unknown. Some are represented by prayers made in this house. But I ask you, God, to go where the situation is. I ask you to work in behalf of the family situations. I ask you, God, to heal. I ask you, God, to deliver. I ask you, God, to raise up. It's all by and through you, God. And at the end of the day, we give you glory and praise and honor. If it wasn't for you, Lord, we would have lost the fight. If it wasn't for you, Lord, we'd be dead ten times over. But tonight, here we are in your house uh, and we're giving you glory and praise uh, I wonder could you clap your hands uh, could you glorify him could you let him know how good he is Woo, hallelujah thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus while you remain standing I've made mention that we normally do our teaching sessions on Wednesday night I just happened to be uh, out of town with my dad. He broke his hip last week. Holy Ghost was moving in this house. I was watching Brother Ballantyne online, and he was feeling after the Holy Ghost. Finally, I just up to text and sent it to him. I said, follow after the Holy Ghost. And, uh, I never saw it, but I heard him just go, <laughs> Pastor said, follow after the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I knew he got the message. Amen. But I appreciate this great church. You know what? It's not every church you go to. That doesn't matter if it's Wednesday night. Doesn't matter if it's Sunday morning, Sunday night. Doesn't matter if it's revival. Doesn't matter if it's prayer meeting. We just want the Lord to have his way in service. I appreciate this church for following after the Holy Ghost. You know what? We don't have to have everything in order. Well, we sure do have to have him in this service. Amen. God bless you tonight. Brother Collins is coming to continue our lesson series. How many would help him preach a little while tonight, would you? God bless you, Brother Collins. Take your liberty. Praise the Lord, everyone. I know I'm just going to start this on the forefront. I know that I'm supposed to be teaching tonight, but I'm going to be honest. I just don't feel much of a teaching spirit in this place. And I, I'm going to tell you that I love how the supernatural all works together. From the kids' song to the praise team song, Pastor, you could have just kept right on going. I could have handed you my notes, sir. Because God has got things right in line with whatever he's going to do tonight. And I'm thankful for what God, God is doing. About the only thing that I've really got tonight that goes along with the, the lesson in our format is the title and some scriptures. But we've got a God here tonight that wants to do something. And, and tonight, if you walked in this house with a need, we've got a God that's here that's able to meet that need. Amen. I would like to give honor tonight to my pastor. And, and, I, and I will. I know this is said around here a lot, but I'm going to say it again. If you, this is your first time here and you've never heard our pastor preach, please do yourself a favor and come back when he's in the pulpit. Because I promise you're going to be blessed. Amen. We've got one of the greatest preachers in the world in this house. I know he don't like accolades, but it's the truth. But I will also say I want to give honor to my wife tonight. I'm thankful she's here. I, I thought about asking her to testify, but I knew I'd get in trouble. No, I'm kidding. I'm just picking on her. 
but I give honor to the, all the ministry in this church. I'm thankful that we are able to unify together for the cause of the kingdom. And I will love every one of you. I will love this great church and this great body of believers. I'm so thankful to be part of the greatest church in, the, in all the world. But for time tonight, if you would turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 4. And uh, starting at verse 43, we've got a little bit of scripture to read tonight. And when you get there, just say amen. Now, the scripture says, Now after two days he departed thence and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast. For they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that, that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The noble man said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour which he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. By the help of the Lord tonight, we're going we're gonna to teach, treat, preach, minister on this, on this thought. From Cana... To Capernaum. Pastor, would you pray? Amen. You may be seated. In John chapter 4, we've read these verses of Scripture, and we find where Jesus was leaving Jerusalem and, and he was heading to Cana of Galilee. Now, normally, that would be around uh, somewhere around 70 miles, so about three days' walk. Uh, but Jesus de detoured through Sychar and Samaria, which took about one day, and he met the woman at the well, as Brother Ballantyne so eloquently uh, ministered on last Wednesday night. He stayed uh, two days, and, and, and the Bible said, and then he went to Cana, which is about another two days' walk. So it took Jesus five days to get to Cana from Jerusalem. Now, the, it, it, the, it was, he was uh, there in Cana for an undisclosed amount of time, but word got out. Somebody say, noised abroad, and got back to a man whose son was dying. Now, the King James Version called him a certain uh, noble man, uh, but, with, but other translations call him a royal official. So he was most likely a man of financial means and influence in the world that he belonged to. No doubt he spared no expense to get his son the best doctors that he could find, to find the best remedies he could to heal his son. But it, nothing that he did worked. No amount of money, no amount of influence could fix the problem, and this daddy was desperate. But then he heard a word from someone that Jesus was in Capernaum. He had heard stories about Jesus, no doubt. And a spark of hope arose in him. And he started on a 25-mile journey. Now, I want you to understand, this just wasn't a straight walk. The elevation between Capernaum and Cana was a 1,700-foot elevation difference going up. 
It was no easy journey. It had uh, treacherous roads and, 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 and things that stood in the way. And this was no, but this was no normal man. You see, this was a father that had been filled with desperation. And he was determined to find an answer to help his dying son be healed. He didn't know the outcome. He didn't know what would happen if he did find Jesus. Maybe he just heard some stories somewhere. And he just, he just had enough faith to believe that maybe this was the only thing that would happen. But he just knew that he didn't want his son to die. And this man went up. Everybody say up. From Capernaum and into Cana. In John uh, 4 and 47, it talks about how uh, the, the Bible says when he heard that Jesus was come, it says that he besought him that he would come down. And he asked him to come down to his problem. To not, and, 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 and I want you to understand tonight that, that, that we do not have to, that Jesus never has to come down to our problem. He is so much bigger and greater than what we can ever imagine. And Jesus just simply can speak the word. But Jesus looked at this, at this situation in, King, in, in uh, John 4, 48. It says, that Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But other trials, you know, to us, that sounds like some great rebuke. He's just kind of telling him off and brushing him off. But when you look at other translations... What it says is, unless you, unless you all or you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And when you begin to study that, you find out he wasn't just directing this to that man. But he was talking, in the moment of your desperate moment, spectators are going to spectate. And it was talking to the people that were all around this man that just wanted to come for a little show. And they just wanted to see what Jesus might happen. They were just looking to see what, what Jesus would do in this man's world. They weren't interested in, in true healing. They weren't interested in this man's desperation. They didn't care about what he was going through. They just wanted to see Jesus do some great thing. And I'm going to tell you when, you, when you go back in the Bible and you look for the woman that had the issue of blood and the Bible talks about her pressing through the crowd uh, and you notice that she reached down and she touched the hem of his garment. Hear me tonight. Uh, because whenever you learn uh, to put yourself down at the feet of the master, the hands will always find you. Uh, he, is a, he is able to reach out to where you are and able to help you and heal you and deliver you. No matter who's thronging around him just trying to say, that they touched Jesus just trying to say that they had been near Jesus when you get to your point of desperation and hear me tonight we don't have you know this, this father he, he had a son the Bible doesn't specify his age it just said he had a son he could have been a teenager he could have been a child he could have been a, you know maybe up in his 20s we just don't know but I, I want to tell somebody tonight that, that when this man left Capernaum, he didn't pick his son up. And he didn't, he didn't pack that weight all the way up to where Jesus was. Uh, Jesus does not expect us to pick up our dilemma. He doesn't expect us to pick up uh, our situation and, and pack it on the journey and, and bring it and lay it at its feet. Uh, the only thing that Jesus is looking for is how desperate are you? Uh, because this father picked up uh, a heart of desperation and just a little bit of faith and he went walking on the road without knowing the outcome there is no there is one that's got the power to take care of every need you have. And he has a miracle. He has a miracle waiting. And this, this father, he, 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 uh, he, gets, he gets up here with Jesus, like I said, and he doesn't realize what's going to go, what's going to happen. But Jesus looks at him and he says, Go thy way, that thy son liveth. And this father turned around and he began to walk down uh, again down the road. And the Bible says in uh, verse 51, I believe it is, that he went back down. You 
know there are times that you're going to come up to Jesus. I want you to understand tonight that you have got to get to a point in your life where nothing else matters. you got to learn that it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is. It doesn't matter what you're walking in. Somewhere along the journey, you've got to learn that Jesus will not always come down to you. But sometimes you've got to be willing to crawl up the dark and weary path and you've got to come up to where Jesus is. You've got to come up on his plane because if you want him to touch you, if you want him to move in your situation, you've got to be able to get to where he's at. Too often times as God's people we let stuff get in the way that hinders us. Uh, maybe a little doubt or a little fear or a little stuff uh, that just stands in the way or the voices of individuals will tell you. You know, like old blind Bartimaeus was sitting on the wayside uh, and he was blind. He couldn't see Jesus. He didn't have a clue where he was. He couldn't see anything. Uh, and, and, uh, and, he, and the people, he began to cry out when he heard that Jesus was near him. Uh, hey, G- uh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Uh, and I can just imagine people telling him, hey, Hey man, you need to be quiet. Uh, you're disrupting stuff. You just need to sit down and be quiet. Uh, that he would just get louder. Jesus, uh, that son of David, have mercy on me. I can just see this man uh, stumbling around and tripping and falling and crawling his way in desperation because he was so tired of being in the darkness. Uh, when you get sick and tired of being in your dark place enough, uh, you're willing to stumble through whatever you got to stumble through, to crawl over whatever you've got to crawl over, to get through it whatever you got to get through and do whatever means necessary to get your desperation to a God that can take care of the need. When the doctor says no, when the bank says no, when the bill collectors are not negotiating, when your marriage is falling apart, when you got sickness in your body, when everything around you says no, we've got a God that when you pour out your desperation is able to say yes. And I promise you that his word will always trump the word of everyone else in your world. Hebrews 11 and 1 in the King James says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation says it like this. Faith is the realization of things hoped for, the proof of of things not seen. When you come, you know, we, we preach it, we preach it. We gotta have greater faith. We gotta have bigger faith. We gotta have mountains of faith. We gotta have faith, faith, faith. But Jesus never said you had to have a mountain of faith. He said you had to have faith the size of a grain of mustard. And that's just like a little infant, just a small speck. And I'm gonna tell you why. Because if you can simply bring that mustard seed of faith to God, He's gonna take care of the rest with grace. And when He puts His grace in action. He's able to take care of anything you have in your world. The Bible says uh, when Abraham was up on the mountain about to sacrifice his son and, and he pulls the knife out and he begins to, to come down, the angel of the Lord grabbed his wrist and, and he told him, now I know that you trust me. You know, that's the problem I think in this modern day church. We don't have enough trust in him. We put our trust in everything else. We put our trust in everyone else. Uh, and he's going, hey, I'm bigger than this. Hey, uh, if you would come to me, hey. Uh, but, this, but this great God uh, that reached out and grabbed his hand. And then Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. And we say the God who will, who, who will provide. But actually, when you go and study that word provide out, that's Latin. And what it means is the God who has seen before. He knew before you got to the situation that you're dealing with right now that you would be there. He's the Alpha. He is the Omega. He's the beginning and He's the ending. He knew. He, he knows how it starts and He knows how it's going to end. But the, the, the equality, the equation is, is if you put Jesus in the middle of that situation, then He becomes the beginning the middle and the ending and he's going to help you walk through to the other side he's the one that will take care of it 
In verse 51, the man was headed back down to his dilemma. When you read, the, it specifically says that he was going down. Uh, but the only thing that he had was faith in a word. He didn't know if his son was dead or if his son was alive. All he had to go on was uh, Jesus said it. Uh, when you go into, and, and what does that significance, uh, signify? Well, w- how significant is that? When you go back to Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said, and God said. When God speaks things happen. When You may not see it now. It, it didn't just unfold now, but when God said, let there be, there was. When God says, let there be a miracle, there's a miracle. When God says, let there be restoration, there's restoration. When God says it's done, it's done. There's no devil in hell that can stop it. There's not a man on the face of this earth that can stop it. Because once God speaks his word, nothing can stand in the way. And there are times, unfortunately, that we have, that once we, we come, and, and hear me tonight, when we, when we do come in our desperation and we, we lay this stuff at Jesus' feet and we get a hold of him, we have to go back towards our problems. We have to go back towards our dilemma. We have to go back towards our struggle. But there was something that took place. Uh, the Bible talks about that this man's servants met him on the way. Where is he at? Sister Liam, you come help me. I'm going to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about tonight. Brother Grayson's going to help me preach. You're all right, buddy. I promise. Brother Collins ain't going to pick on you. This precious lady right here, I want you to know, I love her like she's one of my own. But her and her husband had a desperate situation. They tried and they prayed and all they wanted was a child. The doctor said, no, it's never going to happen. I remember the service, Sister Leanne. There were three different individuals in this church that gave you a word that night. Not knowing that each of those individuals gave that word. I remember when you were holding the baby doll up on the sanctuary. They had been through pain. They had been through heartache. They had been through all kinds of, of, of stuff in the process. And they received a word. And then I can remember another service that I saw Brother Ryan walking back and forth uh, up here uh, along this altar, rocking his arms like he was holding a child. But the doctor said no. But you see, what happened was is they received a word. And they carried the word, even though they were still walking towards the desper- uh, the situation, even though they were still hearing the doctors say no, even though they were hearing people say it was never going to happen. But then something happened. They, they, here, they, they're walking uh, back down the road, the long treacherous trail that they had been on for so long. And then all of a sudden on the horizon, there was a dust cloud, uh, and there was some feet carrying a word uh, that said, hey, uh, Jesus did it. So what I'm trying to say is that when you get a word from God and the confirmation is coming on the horizon, it births a testimony. And God is trying to tell somebody tonight that if you would just put your trust in him and cling to the word that he gives you, eventually, eventually, eventually on the horizon, you're going to see an answer coming and God has taken care of it. And I've talked about going up to God. And I, you people will say, well, we can't go to heaven. He's got to come down. No. You see, we think uh, in, our, in our minds, we think too, uh, too dimensionally. You know, John, the, in Revelations, the Bible said that John saw a throne and one on the throne. John was shown what his human finite mind could comprehend and understand. If he would have seen heaven... And exactly the way it really is, he would have not understood anything. Because God isn't a great, big, uh, huge, gigantic uh, body sitting on this great, big throne uh, up here in the midst of the ether somewhere. He is an omnipresent, omnipotent God. That means that he fills all time and space and eternity. The universe does not contain God. God contains the universe. Uh, God is greater than anything. And so uh, when we get to this point of our desperation... 
and we've got to get up to where God is. That means that we have got to learn that there are things in our life that we have to get out of the way. We've got to get rid of pride. We've got to get rid of of arrogance. We've got to get rid of doubt. And we've got to get rid of fear. And we've got to pray beyond these things because we've got to get ourselves up on a spiritual plane to to where God is. And And fear and doubt and unbelief cannot inhabit the places that God inhabits. But when we learn that get in our moment of complete and absolute desperation and we just have that little bit of faith and we say, God, I'm going to believe no matter what. I don't understand. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know how or how it's going to take place. But all I know is that I've got to get up to where you are. And you've got to learn that we've got to begin the climb. The climb isn't easy. You know, when you have carnality in the way and you're dealing with self, it's not easy. You know, the easiest way not to sin is don't be there. If you know you're not supposed to be involved in it, if you know you shouldn't be watching it, if you know that you shouldn't be reading it, You know, for 24 years, I've been in this. And I've, I've heard what I'm, uh, some of the stuff I'm about to say. Before I got in church, I had a severe porn addiction. Bad. And God delivered me from that. But all I ever hear is about men struggling with porn. Men dealing with porn. Men watching this. Men looking at this. Men, reading, men going online and, and looking at this. But ladies, if it's written in black and white in a book... It's just as bad as what they're looking at on the screen. And whenever you allow that kind of stuff to get in your, in your home and in your life, and in your, it blocks you from getting up here to where Jesus is at. And so we got to learn how to get that garbage out of, our, out of our lives and out of our way and out of our mentality and out of our home. When we come into the house of God and we're too prideful and we sit on a church pew uh, knowing that we've got a desperate situation, but we just don't want everybody else to, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what anybody thinks about me whenever I've got a problem when i got a situation I know uh, that there is a rock that is higher than I and I need him I need him in every breath I need him every moment of my life and I want to get everything out of the way that i got to get out of the way to get to him there's some of you in this house tonight I've said it earlier but your marriage is a struggle You're broke. You're struggling. It doesn't seem you pay your tithes, you're giving an offering, but it just seems like there's a devourer there sucking everything away. Your kids backslid. You got all this stuff going on in your world. Uh, but, and you don't know what you're going to do. Uh, and you say, but I haven't got a word. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, 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 I don't, uh, you know. And, and then you, you keep, uh, you come to church. You're faithful to come to the house of God. And, and you're trying to push through the moment. Uh, well, you see, you're on the journey right now from, from going up from Capernaum to Cana. And you're struggling through the process uh, because you know you're desperate. You know your mind's under attack. And, and you're dealing with all kinds of struggles going on. I've been there. I've been to the point before where the anxiety had me pushed down and the depression had me pushed down so far I couldn't see up. I I didn't, excuse me, I didn't know what was down. I couldn't make my way out. Uh, But somewhere in the midst uh, of the struggle in the darkness, uh, I found my place uh, on my hands and knees crawling uh, up a dark road trying to find my way back to the one that I knew could fix it all. And you have... You say, well, how do we do that? Well, Matthew 11 and 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. You know, for years, I I read that scripture. I'm like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. What does this mean, the suffereth violence? What does all this mean? Well, when you begin to study, you find that that phrase, suffereth violence, is one Greek word, beazo, and it means to enter with force. So what it's saying is that when heaven comes on the scene, it bars its way in. It enters with force. But then it says, the, it says, and the violent, 
That word violent in the Greek is biastes, and it means forceful and eager pursuit. Luke 16 and 16 is the mirror of this verse, and it puts it like this. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. What it's saying is, when you walk into the house of God and that man of God is preaching from that pulpit, there's a word coming forth for you. But you've got to be willing to press into the things of heaven. You've got to be willing to press your way through. You've got to be willing to push with everything you got. And you've got to cling to that word. You see, Jesus does not have to come down and put his hands on our situation. He did come down. He came down to earth, born of a woman, abused, beaten, and crucified for our mind, body, and soul. He descended into hell and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave and gave them to the church so we would have uh, apostolic dominion restored. You see, when Adam was in the garden, God gave Adam dominion in the forefront. And it was the right and by the law of God that man had dominion on this earth. Satan entered into the garden and he tripped up man and he got man to, to get his mind and eyes off God and do what God had forbidden. And you see, that's the thing. There's a lot of forbidden fruit in our life as, as Pentecostals, and everybody just looks at them as rules. You see, that's what happened with Eve. It was just a rule. It's no big deal. And then she took, she gave to her husband, and he ate. And they were kicked out of the garden. And God, through his mercy and his grace, you know, and that ought to tell some folks right there, God don't like you to show up and not be holy. He covered them. But he put skins on them. But they, because of the curse, they lost, they lost their right to dominion of this earth. Satan cast out of heaven. God, he, he got dominion in this earth because this became his kingdom. That's why whenever he, was, uh, he took Jesus up on the high mountain and he said, Look, all of this I'm going to give you. But what he didn't understand is that he had come down in the form of a man. Why? He came through his own law. and He was born of a virgin. He was born of a woman. And, and it was through this and through his death and burial and, and resurrection that he took that dominion back away lawfully from the enemy. And he gave it back to the church rightfully to where it belongs to humanity. And that is why I'm telling you that the same power and authority that Jesus had resides in each and every single one of you if you have been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, you have got the keys. You've got the keys to healing. You've got the keys to deliverance. You've got the keys to authority. You've got those keys in your hand. <clears throat> Jesus was on the cross. And he said, it is finished. In our Bibles. But it was really one Greek word that he that he spoke called tetelestai. And what that really means is paid in full. What did he pay in full? He paid for our salvation and he paid for our healing. God cares as much, as much about your mind and your body as he does your soul. You say, Brother Collins, can you prove that? Oh, I can prove that. Because if he didn't, he would have never took the crown of thorns. That's what that represents for the healing of the mind. That's why they planted that and shoved it down on his head. And he went through the pain and the torture of the cat of nine tails. The Bible says, by his stripes we were, past tense, we were made whole. Because he cares as much to make you whole and to heal your mind and your body as he does to save your soul from a devil's hell. He wants to save you from the curse of humanity because sickness and disease and mental disorders and all that came from the curse of the garden. And when you are a child of God and you are filled with his spirit, you have the power to overcome it because it was paid in full. You wonder, you need a word tonight? He healeth the broken, Psalms 147 and 3 says, He healeth the broken in heart, and He bindeth up their wounds. So that means that when your heart broken, your marriage is on the rocks. 
you're falling apart and you don't know what you're going to do and you can't find the answer. The answer is right there. He healeth the brokenhearted. He can fix any situation. If you would learn how to, to, to quit going into combative mode and find an altar and begin to seek and get up on his plane because I'm telling you, when you show up where he is, he's going to send a word to where you are. And that situation where your marriage looks like it can't be fixed, it will be fixed. It said he bindeth up their wounds. When your body's broken and it's weak and you're tired, he will fix it. He made it. He formed it. He could put it back together again. In Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Bring in a word. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted uh, that, that is, that is uh, weak and weary and troubled uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives, uh, those that are bound by the hands of the enemy and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. When it speaks this, it is not talking about going to the jail. It's not talking about going to a prison house. It's talking about those that are bound up in their minds uh, through the affliction of anxiety and depression and bipolar and all of those things that the mind attacks. Uh, and he is given a word that says you can be restored, you can be healed, you can be delivered you can make your way out you can, you can you can your kids are backslid and you're, you're wondering, uh, is it ever going to be fixed? Ezekiel 34 and 16 says, I will seek uh, that which was lost and bring again uh, that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong, meaning the prideful and the arrogant, and I will feed them with judgment. But when you learn to humble yourself before God, where there was once judgment, there is now grace and mercy. And when you were sick, now you were whole. When you were lost, and now you're found. The title of the lesson tonight was From Cana to Capernaum. It wasn't from Capernaum to to Cana. You've come to the house of God tonight. And there's some of you, you need the Holy Ghost. There's some of you, you've sought for years. Mm. There's some of you, you're broken in body. You're dealing with migraines. You're dealing with, uh, with all kinds of physical ailments and pain. You're dealing with diabetes. You're dealing with all this stuff. And you've bore it and you've bore it and you've bore it. But the Word says, ye were made whole. It doesn't say you will be. It doesn't say it says you were. So what I'm trying to say is, you see, God is on an eternal plane. And we've just got to catch up to where he's at. We're here. But whenever we learn to get up here, and we get up here where Jesus is at, we get up on this plane, you catch up to where he's at. Whenever it says we were made whole, we catch up with the miraculous flow of God. We catch up with the the miracle working of power of God. And it's when we get to this point, when we get up here with Jesus, that he can say, it's taken care of. It's paid in full. It's over with. It's done. You just look on the horizon. They're coming home. You look on the horizon. I got a healing coming for you. Look on the horizon. Your miracle's coming with your name on it. But you've got to just be willing to get in your mind that daddy didn't have a clue, but he had a word and he had faith. We've got to learn to leave this house tonight with a word and with faith to believe that when we start back down from Cana to Capernaum, that God is going to do exactly what he said he would do. If you'd stand tonight, musicians would come. I'm going to tell everybody in this church tonight, none of us really knows the fullness of the other one's story. But one thing I've learned in 24 years of living for God, I haven't always got it right. I wish I could tell you I've been the epitome of a great saint. My wife can tell you that's not true. 
I haven't always had it together. But you know when you're in those crumbling, broken down moments and you feel like you're a rotten, dirty sinner and you feel like you have no hope in the world and you think that God could give a care less about who you are, I'm going to tell you that we misunderstand because God's not a big bully in the sky with a big stick waiting to beat us every time we fail and mess up. But what I'm going to tell you to not hear me, hear me somebody. The God of all creation of mercy and grace that robed himself in flesh and came down to this earth to save humanity, to, to be able to open the door for the miraculous again. That same God would rather restore you as replace you. And if you would just learn tonight to trust him and to come unto him and to get into his presence, like I said in the beginning, just leave your struggle where it's at. Leave your problem right there. You don't have to drag it to the altar. The only thing he wants you to bring tonight is just a little bit of faith. That's all you need to bring tonight. And carry your desperation. And I promise you tonight, because you're going to look back on Wednesday uh, on a Wednesday night at, at 8.07 p.m. And you're going to say, hey, I remember I got a word from God. Because you're going to run into the situation where you are going to see the miraculous come to pass in your life. And everything you thought was never going to work out. It's all going to work out. Why? Because we have a God that is on our side. We've got a God that loves us. We've got a God that wants to bring us through. Where tonight... As the musicians come, I'm going to ask this great body of people here tonight. If you have a desperation, it's okay. We've all been there. You don't have to be ashamed of that. If you've got a struggle, if you're bound in brokenheartedness and weakness and tired, and you're just tired and you're tired and you're ready to, for it to be over, if you're just sick of going through the same merry-go-round and the same roller coaster over and over, it's time to get off and get on the path. And make your way up to where Jesus is. Because I promise you tonight. Not because I preach it. Not because I say so. But because this says so. That when you can get yourself up on that plane. Where he's at. You're going to walk out of here with a word. And everything that you've been walking through. It will. It will begin to change. But I open this altar tonight and I ask every person in this house, come to this altar and stay at this altar until you can get yourself up to where Jesus is and you walk out of this house with your word. You'll never leave me. You said that you won't forsake me. You're right beside me And that is all that matters You'll never leave me You said that you won't forsake me You're right beside me And that is all that matters You are a covenant
Can we lift our hands and love the Lord across this house tonight? Presence of the Lord close in this place right now. Oh, how we bless you, Lord. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm not really sure of the whys, but I do feel to convey. And over 20 years ago now, 22 or 4 years ago, the Lord had given me a word that I was coming to Iuka that time I think there was 32 or 36 I can't remember 15, 15 of those were kids and Shompert, the Lord said you're going full time I said well that's going to be interesting I said do I need to sell the house do I need to sell the cars, the RV what I need to sell doesn't matter to me God whatever I need to do the Lord reminded me a minute ago. I was praying. I said, Lord, what about these finances? What about all this stuff? I'll never forget it. I use this phrase. Matter of fact, this week sometime with somebody, Sister Marie, the Lord said, you take care of the fish. I'll take care of the coins. I never forgot it. I remember it. <laughs> so I'm just praising the Lord. It's going to be taken care of. The Lord reminded me it was a Wednesday night, just like this Wednesday night. I was preaching for R.H. Johnson down near Macomb, Mississippi. Guy in the church, I asked somebody this week that knew the guy, can't remember his name, he's a car dealer down there across the road from Brother Ballard's church. He found out the girls like to ride horses. So they were, they were out there in the pasture this guy's house, riding, riding horses. I was leaned up against the fence watching him. The telephone rings. It's my dad. He had small talk. How's things going? How's revival going? Yada yada yada. He said, "Oh yeah, by the way, you remember that lady that come by to your house before you left, going to preach this this time?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, I thought I'd let you know that lady come by, deposited two checks, and just paid your house off. And you said God can't take care of it. He can. He does. I don't know how he's going to work it out, Sister Ann. All I know, he said, you take care of the fish. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You take care of the fish, I'll take care of the coins. And it's been that way ever since. It was that way when we had 30. It was that way when we had 60. It was that way, Brother Blake, when we had 100. It was that way when we're nearly running 200. Today, the Lord is still control of the coins. And what we need to do is take care of the fish. And I feel revival in this house right now. I feel revival in this house right now. And some of you have been questioning, how's God going to do a thousand soul revival? You let God take care of all that business. We just take care of the fish. How about that? There's something breaking in this house right now. You better understand God's at work in the equation. God's at work in the equation. Come on, 
Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it ain't nothing for God. Ain't nothing for God. Ain't nothing for him. Come on, Pastor. We were eating supper after church Sunday night. I know I'm rambling. It's all right. We were eating supper talking about the connections that God has put in place in the last few days. I made mention of some, took us offline for the case, make mention of some God was making connection to. I was talking to one of the guys from the church at supper, and he said, that grandfather that's planning on coming to church Sunday, do you know who his wife is? No. He said, that's a backslid family out of this church. That's their daughter. And when she shows up with her husband, they're going to be coming with her. And then his son's going to be coming. And it started down the list, one right after the other. May I tell you that God is at work in the equation behind the scenes. We just need to take care of the fish, somebody. I said, we need to take care of the fish. It's an end time revival that's not just for Iuka. Brother Melton, it's for killing. Woo. Brother Brian, it's for Boonville. It's for whosoever will. I don't care who they are. I don't care where they're from. Re- revival is taking place right now. We just got to take care of the fish. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm believing God is working in behalf of that baby right now. I don't care if their church said that miracles died with the, with the passing of the apostles. Hello, somebody. There's a God that's still at work. I love to dot the eye of the devil right now. How many in here know that there's a God that heals? Look around this house right now at the hands. There is a God that heals. Why? I'm a living testimony of the fact. Hallelujah. While you remain standing, Brother Valentine's coming. We got other needs that we need to pray for tonight. The Valentine, whatever you feel, sir. Amen. Praise the Lord. I kind of fit that description a little bit myself. I'm a little bit of a living testimony of the goodness of God. You know, God's been so good to me. In so many ways, you know, just just the fact that I'm standing here alive, breathing God's good air, is one great testimony, Brother Adam. I was sharing with guys in the jail a couple weeks ago some of the things that I went through and some of the things that happened, and sitting here looking at a bunch of I'm not trying to be stereotypical, but I'm sitting here looking at a bunch of hardened guys doing time, sleeved out tattoos, all the stuff, all the all the things, you know, and they're they're in there because they're dealing with they're dealing with addictions, they're dealing with anger, they're dealing with all kind of trouble and turmoil in life. And I watched these big hardened, burly men as I began to tell him about the goodness of God and what I had been through and how God had kept his hand on me, I began to see tears run down their face. And they said, you, you, you did what? I said, lady pulled out in front of me and I, I hit her with, I was on my motorcycle and she was in a Chevy Equinox SUV, about 17, 1800 pound car. And it flipped it. My bike weighed 660 pounds of me on it. I put it on the scale. Uh, and I, I didn't walk away from it at that moment, but I'm walking away from it now. And then, just to kind of dip into what Pastor was talking about, then I'm sitting here 10 days 
in the trauma unit at Vanderbilt. Three months in a wheelchair, six months of physical therapy, all these different things going on. I'm getting all these letters from Vanderbilt and these nice pretty envelopes with all this algebraic equations in it. <clears throat> Somewhere to the tune of in the neighborhood of three quarters of a million dollars. Six, seven hundred thousand plus dollars of doctor bills. Plus, have a $80,000 helicopter ride. It's the most expensive helicopter ride, I think, in the history of helicopter rides. And, uh, you know, the Lord took care of every bit of that. These folks just said, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll just accept this, what you got. Uh, we won't worry about that $80,000 helicopter ride. We'll just call that good. We'll just, we're just going to write that off. Uh, we're just going to take this other on what you did get. And uh, my, my job was so good to me just a couple years before all this stuff happened. They changed our insurance stuff at work. And our, our work provides for all the salaried employees uh, full paid uh, short-term disability so while I was in the uh, trauma center while I was at home in the bed and in the wheelchair and all these things I was getting a paycheck just like I was at work the whole time never missed a beat never never missed a thing on my on my house payment my car payment Anything that I had outstanding, the Lord just took care of it all and just showed out through it all. And uh, he's still, he's still doing great things. And I just, I, I, I tell people about it all the time. I just can't, I just can't tell it enough. Can't thank him enough. I'm sure some of you here that have heard it many times probably get sick and tired of hearing me talk about that. I think it's the only thing I ever talk about. And it's not, but I do talk about it a lot. Because I am thankful for the goodness of God. And I just know that if God can do it for somebody like me, somebody that come out of a world of, of addiction, somebody that come out of a home of abuse, somebody that walked out of a out of a place of a lifestyle that was that was less than appealing uh, it, to, to, to put it lightly. And God will do that for me. Imagine what he'll do for you great folks. Amen. With that being said, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer tonight. We've got several, several needs. I feel faith. Wow, I feel faith elevated in this house right now. We got several needs. I'm going to approach this a little bit differently tonight, if that's okay, Pastor. Mm -mm. Uh, I'm going to read through these. We need to we need to pray for Elizabeth tonight. We need to pray for continuation of revival. Uh, all the churches under Brother Lambert, our, our uh, other works that's going on. Those men that look to him as pastor. Uh, God's doing great things all around this tri-state area. Revival in their churches. We're not the only church baptizing folks. We're not the only ones seeing people get filled with the Holy Ghost. I've been hearing great testimony of things going on. I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord for that. We need to remember Bishop and Sister White and the wonderful things that are going on there in Texas and everywhere he's going all over the country and preaching. And also our pastor and Sister Lambert, especially we need to remember uh, Sister Lambert and her family and the things uh, going on there with all of that. And God would just put his hand up on all of that. There are other requests tonight across the house by the lifting of your hands all across the house. Amen. I see hands everywhere. And I, I'm just going to, I've been listening. May, maybe I shouldn't listen to so much preaching. I don't know. I've been listening to Brother Robinette. And uh, I'm just going to speak the word of faith tonight. How about that? 
We, we always, we used to talk about that, used to hear a lot about that. Billy Cole would go on a mission field, speak the word of faith. Thousands of people get the Holy Ghost. Brother Robinette goes all over these crusades and speaks the word of faith and all this stuff. Why can't we speak the word of faith right here in America? Why can't we speak the word of faith on a Wednesday night right here in Iuka, Mississippi? So if you've got your need represented tonight, we're going to speak the word of faith. God, by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak the word of faith right now into every situation, into every need. I lose miracles, signs, and wonders. God, not because we need miracles, signs, and wonders to believe you, but because you said that you went with them, confirming your word with signs following. Lord, right now, you're going to begin to move and work to heal to perform the miraculous to move in homes to loose your angels to go to minister to backsliders across this city and across this tri-state area God you're going to begin to draw God you're going to begin to connect even those right now that are connected online God you're going to begin to loose conviction to flow God you're going to open doors for Bible studies God you're going to open doors for a greater presence in this city for this church to be a shining light and a beacon of hope unto this people. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we lift our hands across the house? I, I don't want to take advantage of your time tonight. So we be sensitive to the Holy Ghost for a moment in this house. Holy God, Holy God, Holy God. Father, in the name of Jesus. Holy, holy, holy God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Come on, church. I think it's appropriate right now if we lift him up. We need to magnify him in this place. He's confirmed his word tonight unto us. He's honored our faith and our faithfulness tonight. Loose his power in this house. Your need that you represent it. By his word, he's spoken tonight said that he's working. He's doing the things that we've asked. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, wow. I'm glad I came to church on a Wednesday night. An awesome word. Thank you, Brother Collins. Awesome word tonight. Thank you, Pastor, for moving us in the spirit tonight. I have a few announcements, and I will get out of the way. Sunday morning service will begin with pre-service prayer in the fellowship hall at 925. And then we will move here into the sanctuary at 10 a.m. Uh, December the 15th is Dickens Family Christmas. Uh, that will be downtown here on Front Street. Uh, it will begin at 6 p.m. and will go to 8 p.m. Um, there will be a lot of stuff going on. The, the shops and things uh, along the downtown area will be open. Everything will be decorated up. Uh, you can dress up like the 1840s, 1850s uh, setting of the uh, Charles Dickens uh, novel, A Christmas Carol, and come hang out. You don't have to dress that way. Uh, you can come hang out in your modern clothes. Stand around the fire pits, talk to folks. Coffee shop will be set up up there with the trailer. Uh, we would appreciate uh, your support there uh, on that. December the 16th, there will be a student, uh, student prayer here at the church at 6 p.m. And the church-wide Christmas dinner is December the 17th at Crow's Neck. Uh, if you plan on attending and have not, let Sister Chastity know. Uh, Sister Chastity, wave your hands. Everybody knows who you are. If you don't know Sister Chastity, uh, please let her know money for the dinner plates is due by the 10th. Uh, so make sure you get with her uh, about that. There is not a time on here for when that is at Eating at 5 o'clock, uh, on, that is on the 17th, so that is the uh, Sunday evening, so instead of our regular evening service here, we'll be meeting there at Crow's Neck, eating at 5 o'clock, uh, it's always a great time, uh, fellowship uh, with our church family. Uh, they're doing hot cocoa bombs for the month of December. Uh, they'll be making those here. If you would like to sell or buy some of those, preferably get a form to help help us sell some of those. Please see Sister Allie. Sister Allie, wave your hands. Everybody knows who you are. Uh, they'll be doing those. Uh, they'll be doing different sizes, different ones, with espresso, without espresso, all different kind of things. Uh, wonderful things uh, with the cocoa bombs. Uh, they, they've been a big hit in the past when we've done those. Also, we're doing the um, same fundraiser for Christmas that we did for Thanksgiving where we will be smoking hams and turkeys, and we will also be preparing pans of dressing. Uh, for anyone who is interested in purchasing any of that, you can also see Sister Allie or Sister Chastity to get uh, on the list for those. Or if you would like to help sell those, uh, if you work in a local business, uh, any of the factories, you have any connection to places you can take um, order forms into and help us sell those, it is a very profitable fundraiser for us when, we, when we're able to do this. And it will all be going toward the mission trip for the ones that are planning on going to Germany next summer and so it will be a great help for them if anyone can pick up an order form uh, take them around the community some of the local businesses things help us sell if you're interested in buying again you can see sister chastity or sister alley about that and i believe that's the last of things find someone shake their hand look around see who's missing text them let them know call them let them know you missed them tonight lord bless you you're dismissed in jesus name